this program. And if you are, whoops, if you are um, watching it later, you get to hear the people that called in because you know what? We all got issues, right? And um, on this show, we talk about our life issues as it relates to kind of shrink land because um, I am your resident head shrinker and we're going to talk about a lot of stuff. First of all, though, I probably um, should give you the number to get on the air. It is 844-940-2774, 844-940-2774. If you get in early, that means that um, your chances are higher of getting on the air. And I want to talk to you because we got the coolest callers in the world. I scan the internet. You're the best. So also the people that don't call, but... All of you are cool. I love hanging out with you. Um, let me see. I was supposed to make a couple of quick announcements before we get into the topic of the day. Um, we have a webinar coming up on reconciliation and estrangement. So if you've got a relationship that you're estranged from, uh, it might be a toxic one and you wonder how that could get put back together. It might be y'all just had a disagreement. And now nobody likes each other. You know, one of you looks at life this way and the other one. Anyway, you got sideways. And uh, many times the one that is listening to stuff like this is not the one at fault. <laughs> but sometimes it takes two to tango. We're going to look at all that. When should you try to reconcile? You know, a lot of times you shouldn't. But there's specific guidelines to know when to and when not to. And sometimes it gets fuzzy. I'm going to help you diagnose those. And if you do want to reconcile and it does look like it might have a chance and when to have hope and you got some hope for good reasons, then I'm going to give you a path of how to do that. That is not guaranteed for every reconciliation. Even God invites everybody and not everybody wants to reconcile. So he's got that problem too. <laughs> Certainly we have it and you can't make the horse drink the water, you can invite them to the water, and you can make sure the water is not poison. In some way, the water attracts them to come. All of that. Reconciliation and estrangement, knowing how to mend and when to move on. April 16th, we're going to be live for at least two hours and also um, having some interaction there. We're going to go through a lot of content and we're going to talk about your problems for those of you that I end up talking to on that one. And it's going to be fun. April 16th, 4 p.m. Pacific. That's 6 p.m. Central. And you can sign up for that. Now, this is not one you can just log into. You actually have to sign up. So easy to sign up. Go to boundaries.me forward slash reconcile. Boundaries.me forward slash reconcile. And while you're there at boundaries.me, uh, check out the boundaries.me site because we have over a hundred courses there on many, many topics related to life. Okay, we are going to hop into uh, kind of the first segment of the program. I always talk about something, um, either something I've been dealing with, with my clients that I work with or in my own life or something from the research or whatever that involves this whole world of psychology and sometimes uh, how faith interacts with that. And the one we're going to talk about today is, um, I, I don't want to use this phrase, uh, non-reluctantly <laughs> because you know i always hate those things the most important thing is and somebody said what's the most important thing in life you know that is it what is it name one thing you need and i go I, you, there's not one i mean you, you want to choose between food air and water there's always a handful but they are in as a human develops psychologically they are in a developmental sequence and that is very important for what we're going to talk about. Now, always the first sequence, we even talked about this yesterday, the first sequence that builds a human, first thing in the sequence that builds a human is how securely attached you are. Your relational connectedness on the planet determines so much of your life. 
because we draw life from outside of ourselves. We're not self-sustaining. We have to be connected, even from infancy all the way to when you're in the in the old folks' home or on the porch. You know, if you have deep relationships, you'll recover from heart attack, stroke, and other illnesses faster than if you don't. Plus, you're much less likely to have one, as all the research has shown. Do you know loneliness? Loneliness has been shown to be as dangerous to your health as smoking almost a pack a day for years. How about that? Immune system, disease, heart disease, all this kind of stuff. So the foundation is what we talked about in yesterday's program about secure attachment. And we talked about what undergirds that. If you have attachment style issues, I suggest you go listen to that. But then the next thing in the sequence that is almost as important. And if you don't have this one, you're going to have obviously so much pain that who cares if it's not the most important. It's killing me. And that is to the degree within your connections. Now we're assuming a relationship here, but that's the problem. You're connected to somebody in a relationship, either friendship or marriage or dating, or they're your kid or your mother or your father, your family of origin, your siblings, your 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 work team, your boss. We have connections, foundational. But what's the second problem? If we're not separate and free from the people we're connected to, then you're in prison. You're enslaved, you're controlled, you're not a whole person to make your own decisions on your own if somebody's controlling you or your behaviors or all of that. You know, the popular term that gets kind of we intervene in this area as we talk about boundaries. But what is a boundary? You know, if you're in a neighborhood, you're connected to your neighbors, right? But you are separate and free from your neighbor. So there's a fence that divides your property line. So how does this happen developmentally? Well, even the physiology and neurological, physical, psychological development can show us Think about this. If you have a baby, you don't, in, you know, after four or five weeks hanging out with the baby, you don't ask the baby, so do you want to go play tennis today or do you want to play chess? They just burp or fart or look at you or something. Because they're not connected enough to have downloaded the capacity to do that stuff. But once they do... Once that little gas gauge, that fuel gauge goes from empty to getting way up here, what's happened? All that stuff is developing and a drive kicks in inside of a human, kind of towards increasingly towards the second year of life. And all of a sudden, they want to be separate from mama or whoever their primary caretaker is, the nurturing love object of the first year, whoever it is, it could be dad, grandma, whoever, but they're securely attached. Well, you know, I love you, but I want to go explore over there separate from you. And I want to make up my own mind and I want to choose to do something besides sit here and be in hell and they'll squirm and try to get away because they're getting mobile now. And a lot of people call that they're moving into the terrible twos. Worst phrase ever is the terrific twos. It's awesome. They're becoming a little person with their own individuality apart from their connections. Said in the way that we talk about it in the field of psychology, this is a phase of separation and individuation. They're separating, not getting rid of and isolating from, but they're separating, becoming separate from the person they're connected with or the people they're connected with. And they're individuating, meaning they're becoming an individual in their own right. So now I'm a neighbor 
connected, there's a fence divides our property line. There's a big word that goes along with this. You know what that word is? No. <laughs> What's the word a toddler has to learn? No, in two directions. They have got to learn to hear no, no. Don't crawl over there in your freedom, but crawl over here instead. No, don't pull the Rottweiler's tail. <laughs> that might not go well, but pet him on the head instead. You got to learn no. And it's the role in toddlerhood to not crush the kid's budding little will or break their will is a lot of people have used it. I hate that phrase. You don't want to break the will of a child. They're going to need that will to will for good things and to will against bad things. You break their will and they get to be 15 years old. They're going to need that will to say no to the drug dealer or somebody trying to use their body. You're not trying to control your child. You're not trying to break their will. You are trying to discipline that will, which actually means to train and teach that will to will for good things and will against bad things. Both in the external world, the hot stove and the Rottweiler or the drug dealer, but also inside themselves. They've got to learn to love the word no inside themselves because that impulse is going to come. I want to do this. My desire says this, but somebody's voice up here told me no. And now I've internalized that. And I hear this. No, that's not a good idea. And I've got to love that word. No, because it will save my life. So to train and discipline a kid's boundaries early on through really good parenting that gives them freedom and choices, but limits and consequences while never losing the love of the attachment. That is what the resolution of this issue is all about, where you can be a separate person from the ones that you love. And you have your own choices and all that within limits and if they have their own limits, when you make choices that are hurtful to them, they will say no to you and you will learn to respect that no. And that's where all this starts. So it's all about developing self-control. Now, here's a question. In your relationships now, where do you, in any relationship, where do you not experience yourself as free? Free to make your own choices without losing love. Free to make your own choices without a guilt trip being put on you. Free to make your own choices in that relationship without them pouting, feeling abandoned, all that kind of stuff. So you can go spend some time for yourself and they don't interpret it as a bad thing. And then you're not free when you interpret their interpretation as, oh gosh, I shouldn't do this. So-and-so is going to be unhappy with me because that's when you've lost your boundaries. When we are controlled by guilt, when we're controlled by somebody's reactions, when we're controlled by all the gaslighting and all the crap that self-centered people do, that's not being separate and free. We're also not separate and free enough to say no to that and stand up to it, to where maybe the abuse or the emotional abuse or whatever can be contained over on their side of the fence and it doesn't get over into your head, body, mind, soul, and everything else. Look at your time and energy. Are you in control of that? Or is it decided upon by somebody else? I remember I was, I was talking to a lady one time and, and her friends, and I knew she had no boundaries. She just gets controlled by what people pleasing, what anybody wants from her. And, and so I said, so, so what are you doing on Thursday? <laughs> I said, she doesn't know yet. They both look at me and, what do you mean? I don't know. I said, you don't know yet because we don't know what controlling person is going to call you that morning and manipulate you into something. So I don't think you can say what you're doing next Thursday because I've seen you. <laughs> I mean, we can make a guess, but, you know, the, your mother calls or, you know, the church calls and puts a little guilt trip on you or your whatever. 
she wasn't free yet. She got there. I remember one time I was doing a group in the hospital and and um, a woman stood up in the middle of the group. She says, I get it. I'm tired of my mother controlling my life and I'm going to stop that from happening no more. And I'm 68 years old. Hey, never too late to kick in what's supposed to happen when you're about two. Now, that doesn't mean a two-year-old gets to do whatever they want. I said there's still limits and boundaries, but they've got to be in control of making choices, and they learn those limits are real. You know, if you if you don't do this, you're going in time out. Okay? Well, they can do it, but they're going in time out. And then we draw the bigger boundaries around where they can't even get into places where it could be dangerous. We all have to learn limits. So where do you experience um, the loss of this? And let me give you some symptoms. Um, a lot of guilt, making decisions, a lot of feeling like you have to do something and you feel obligated to do it, but you're not really free to say no. You have kind of a no allergy. You know, there's a lot of good foods that people are allergic to. And if they eat them, they get sick. Well, what happens when you try to say no? Does your heart start palpitating? Look like you got a full on adrenal reaction, just like, Somebody had shrimp that's allergic to selfish. So a lot of internal stuff. How about fears of rejection or fears of abandonment or fears of lack of approval? Fears of somebody's anger, fears of somebody's, you know, disapproval. You know, a lot of that secure attachment stuff we talked about is undergirded by a lot of, you know, I'm insecure in my relationship because what if what if I do something wrong? I remember a guy one time um, was telling me about his marriage, and I said, I said, well, how's it going? He said, well, you know, it's, it's going better. He literally said this, and he meant it. He wasn't being funny. He said, you know, it's it's going pretty good right now. He said, but I'm you know I'm a little scared because like every now and then I know I'm going to have an opinion. <laughs> I said, why is that a problem? Well, if I have an opinion, I mean, it, it is not going to be good with her. Well, maybe we got to work on your separateness from her so you can have some opinions. So we're talking about when you're separate, then are you separate enough to experience your feelings? Are you separate enough to examine and experience your attitudes? Are you separate enough to have control of your behavior? and your choices, and your values, and your limits, and your talents, and be able to execute those. Your thoughts, your desires, the things you love. Are you free to be able to make those decisions for yourself? So what kind of symptoms do you have? Well, sometimes being out of control, impulsive behavior is, in some ways, a boundary problem because there's no no muscle inside that's saying no to those impulses. There's not enough structure. And a lot of times we have people that are very ambivalent about over-controlled and out of control. And they vacillate back and forth. I mean, really shut down and then go on a binge. All right. A lot of times I used to treat a lot of eating disorders and you'd see the, in bulimia, you'd see the binge purge cycle and, a lot of times, you know, the, the problems of individuation and separating from the family and separating from a parent are kind of all tied up. A lot of marriage problems. There are too many marriages. If there is one marriage in this world, it's too many. That is not separate from the two families of origin. Now, I don't mean not have a relationship. I mean having control of your own marriage, your house, your kids and how you have chosen as a free second generation in that chain or whatever you are, you are second to your parents, to be able to be self-governing. What we're talking about here is self-control. So where'd you lose this? It's a good thing to go back and see where you lost it. A lot of times developmentally, people in the media say, well, it's my mother, or it's my father, or it's my church, or it's my dominating sibling, or it's my grandfather. There were one, one poor guy I worked with that's just so talented, but he couldn't do anything his grandfather didn't approve of. 
I remember one physician who was a very talented surgeon, but he became a surgeon because his father was a surgeon, his grandfather was a surgeon, and the pressure on him to become one he couldn't separate from. He wanted to be an artist. He wanted to be a musician. But he became a great surgeon, hated his work, hated his career, but he kept his dad and grandfather happy until one day, not one day, several days over time, he had drive to individuate that God put in every human being, that drive to become separate and have my own will, started to assert itself. Now, it would have been better had he turned to his dad and granddad and said, you know what, I'm, I'm leaving medicine, I'm going to pursue the arts. But what he did was he just kind of passive aggressively, and passive aggressive behavior a lot of times is an effort in creating separateness. He passive aggressively just started to do some things that would give him the freedom from being a doctor, like leaving sponges and scissors and stuff like that inside of patients during surgery. And he had a few um, malpractice cases and pretty soon the hospital helped him separate and individuate from his family. And later, which you could go listen to him play his guitar. Hey, it's going to come out. It's going to come out. Passive aggressive behavior, especially because people get angry when they're controlled, but they're going to dig you by talking to somebody else or triangulating instead of directly saying no. They're going to nod their head yes and then go talk about you behind your back, show how bad you are for victimizing them. Well, you're not victimizing them, maybe. What they're doing is they're just not being honest with you. They're not saying no. There's called your siblings say, can you believe they're making me do this? I hate that phrase, you make me so this, that, and the other, when it's something that somebody really didn't have the power to make you or make us. And one of the things I hear all the time, I used to get this question a lot in live events. So Dr. Cloud, what do you, how do you deal with a controlling person? And I would always say, well, you convert them. They go, well, they're not really interested in God. I said, I didn't say convert them to God. What do you mean? Well, I think you should convert them from being a controlling person into being a frustrated person. Because if you say no, they are no longer a controlling person. They don't have control of anything. They're just frustrated because their wish is to control you. They learn you are separate and free, and they don't have any jurisdiction over in that zip code. That's what separateness is. Separateness is when you can experience yourself as free to know and experience and modulate your own feelings, attitudes, behaviors, choices, values, limits, talents, thoughts, desires, and loves. Now, just because we're free doesn't mean everything in our yard is good either. Key point. Well, I'm free. I can do anything I want. Well, good luck with that because there's this other boundary called reality. And as many people have learned, when they got out from the controlling environment, turn 18 and go out there and be free, do whatever they want, they end up in rehab or jail or a bunch of failed relationships. Yeah, you're free. But well, we're never free from reality. And that's what boundaries are about. Organizing our lives to the realities of God's ways, because we're going to bump into it. I mean, you can disagree with the law of physics, but if you think you're free to, you know, I'm up on a very high story here. <laughs> I'm free to, I'm free to move around this room and go over to the window, stick my head out. But if I think I'm free to go past that, I am, but Plop, I'm going to learn realities there. So, so I want you to be totally free and be in control. And then of the things inside of you that can get you in trouble in a real way. You know, we have some feelings that you got to be free to feel them, but you also have to be free to modulate them. And so let's say we need to be free to feel our anger really important to be able to feel it and own it and name it 
And then we're free to choose to respond to the situation that's making us angry instead of not be free enough to respond. We react. Well, that's got something to do with how separate we are from whoever we're in a conflict with. Very, very important. Very important. What prevented you from getting this? Did you lose it in relation to not having enough love? I said, if we don't feel securely attached, you're going to be afraid to leave home. Or you're going to be afraid to disagree because you need love so bad, you'll put up with any kind of behavior. So it happens in a lot of codependency. You put up with a bad boyfriend or you put up with somebody that's not good for your behavior because you need the love so much. And that's more important anyway. As I said, it's more foundational that people make a conscious or unconscious decision that a bad relationship is better than no relationship. That's what some people do all the time. Not enough love. How about not enough separateness? You had a, some of you are old enough to remember the old American Express commercials. American Express, don't leave home without it. Remember that? Well, some of you had an American Express mother or American Express father. You know, don't leave home without it. Like you didn't have enough separateness and freedom to go explore the world and make your own choices and all that kind of stuff because it has so micro-controlled you that now it's in your head. Some people, not enough freedom was celebrated or even encouraged. You know, when our daughters, you know, living in California, um, we, we told them everything possible. Look, when you go to college, then you can go wherever you choose, but we strongly encourage you, don't go to school here. Go experience another part of the country. Go experience another culture. Leave home. <laughs> go, by, I mean, you, you, you'll be over 18, you can do anything you want. And when you're out of school, you certainly you can live wherever you want. But we would strongly encourage to go do something separate. And I remember when, when our little one had some uh, trauma with, and, and it happened in an airplane and she developed some anxiety symptoms and she started being afraid to have, do overnight sleepaways, you know, when she was probably, oh, I don't know, this had been six or seven, seven, eight, something like that. And, and she would call, you know, he wouldn't want to go. I'd make her go because I wouldn't let that fear take over life. And then, you know, we get a call about nine o'clock at night, come get me, come get me. Say, you know, Lucy, you know, it's kind of scary, but I want you to stay there. So we'll see you tomorrow. Good night. And not only celebrating their separateness, really, really being an advocate for it. I remember um, when I was in training, one of my professors said, you know, psychologists have to deal with a lot of tough stuff. Um, and, you know, it's going to be hard <laughs> to help some situations. But if you want to have a 95% successful career, 95% of all of your cases end up well, then just treat school phobias. Well, what do you mean, Dr. So-and-so? Well, because all you got to do is go to school and claw the mother or the father's arms away from the kid and make him go to school, and in three days, they'll be fine. Now, in some cases, there's underlying stuff that that is not good. But the point is that our separateness should be celebrated. And we got too much helicopter parenting going on uh not enough consequences maybe you grew up with not enough consequences to learn that there are real boundaries in the universe maybe the consequences were too punitive so that you were afraid and developed some fear or you were overpowered or controlled or some religious teaching boy <laughs> well, that's a whole nother topic a lot of spiritual abuse keeps people from their freedom it's so interesting how the church sometimes can be so controlling, not the good ones, but the controlling ones. And yet, one of my favorite verses, 
in Galatians 5, it says, it is for freedom that Christ has set you free. There's no such thing as love without freedom, and God wants us to be free to love him. It's also why we have so many problems in the world, because he valued love so much that he gave us freedom. I I love it in, in um, gosh, where is that? Would that be? I don't exactly know where the verse is. Where Joshua, you know, you always hear Joshua's famous verse. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And I always ask, ask church audiences, so what does it say right before that? And literally, I've never heard anybody be able to answer that question. They always know, as for me and my house, choose you whom you're going to serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. What's the verse right before that say? You know what it says? If it's disagreeable to you to serve the Lord, then serve whom you will. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Were you free to make your own faith determination? A lot of people feel controlled into it and they're, you know, that parents don't give them the freedom to become a child of God. They're like a grandchild. They don't have any choice. Do we give the freedom to choose? God always does. Now he says there's going to be consequences, but he always gives us freedom. So that's what being separate is all about. It's very important to life. Like the old country and Western song, how can I love you or miss you? No, it's miss you. He goes, how can I miss you? If you never go away, and sometimes they're smothering, controlling, you know, clingy relationships, and it's like, get out of my face. I can't miss you if you never go away. So important stuff. All righty. Um, there's our thought for the day. By the way, um, we are um uh, we're going to um if you go to the boundaries.me site, if you you know, connected with anything I was just talking about um, for all of you later. If you're a Boundaries.me member, be sure to log in to the Boundaries.me site and we are going to um, have an outline and some stuff about this for your use later. If you're a Boundaries.me member, go log into the site later on. Everything I just talked about will be up there. And also, um, we have several courses on the site about this. It goes into much greater depth than I could do today and a lot of steps for you to take. If you're not a member, just go to the boundaries.me site and just sign up for a free trial. If you don't want to be a member after the free trial, I think you get a couple of weeks or something. I don't know what the time is, but you can go on right now and have a free trial and get, the outline, but also get access to all the courses and you can hang out on the site and all that for free for a little bit of a trial period. We do find that most people that do the free trial end up becoming members. A lot of stuff on there. It's kind of like a, uh, I always say it's sort of like a graduate education in psychology um, without a degree. So You'll know a bunch of stuff, but it won't make you licensed. It'll just hopefully help you live life better. All right. Our write-in question. My boyfriend gets jealous easily, but my friends say that means he really loves me. Is that true or is this a problem? I'm going to break that down to, is it true? And the second thing, is that a problem? Um, is that true that he loves you? Well, um, I don't know. I would have to look at his behavior to see how deep the love is. You know, while we're on the topic, though, about when we can tell what love looks like, um, one of the good, there's a lot of ways we can think about um, a bit about this, but I'm going to just read you something real quick here. Let me pull it up. Uh, there we go. Um, if you want to know, kind of, when say, does somebody love you? Because, you know, bonding chemicals can feel like love. It's kind of a 
drug trip that happens, um, you know, when somebody first begins to, you know, connect a lot of, you know, you know, a lot of people, a lot of sexual attraction, a lot of chemistry, and they, they instantly, you know, hook up and they're feeling all these bonding chemicals that happen in that. And they interpret it as love because it feels like you're some kind of trip. It feels really good, but love's a little more than that. That's part of it, but it's a little more than that. Let me give you a um, pretty good list of the question. Does he love me? Is he patient? See, patience requires taking the other person's well-being into account. Is he kind? We love somebody. We're kind towards them. We treat them with tenderness and all that. It doesn't envy. Is he envious? Can he celebrate when you get good things that he doesn't necessarily get? Does he boast? Is your love like a relationship, sort of like a possession? Are you kind of like a possession? Or he's boast about his life or be proud? Is he rude to you? That's not love. Is he selfish in his love? Love is not self-seeking. Is he easily angered? Does he keep a record of your wrongs, the things that he considers wrong that he doesn't like? Does he take pleasure in when bad things happen or doing bad things? Does he try to seek the truth for you? Does he go through things and persevere and bear through those conflicts? Does he maintain hope when things are going bad for you or do a thing? Does he endure all of that stuff? Pretty good test. See if he loves you. Those of you who have ever been to a wedding <laughs> or more than three, you've probably heard that. That's out of 1 Corinthians 13, where it gives a description of love. Love is more than attachment. Love is more than warm feelings. Love is more than sexual, you know, excitement and connectedness and chemistry. All of those things are built in to certain contexts of love. Attachment has its own chemistry. You know, we're biologically attached. That's why it's so hard to lose them. But it goes more than that into the mature love and, you know, the kind of relationship you're talking about with a boyfriend. You're adults probably, and you better kind of be mature. In the Bible, the word mature means complete. So we want love to be complete, not perfect, but complete, have all the elements of love. So you can answer that. There's a pretty good acid test. If he loves you. You can show it to him. And also... Um, there's another thing that can happen sometimes in immature love. It may be more dependency or neediness than love. Love relishes the separateness and the freedom that you have. Love and freedom go together. All right. So is it, does he love you? Like his friends say, or is, you know, is that true? Well, there's a good test. Now, the second thing he said, is this a problem? Yes. Yes. Jealousy is a problem. Now, jealousy is, as jealousy does, jealousy will kick in when there is an actual threat to a loss of love. All right? You know, we're we're told in the scriptures to not be jealous. It also says that God is a jealous God. Well, what does that mean? Well, God is not jealous for you having friends. God's not jealous or envious when you have good stuff in your life. God's not jealous when, you know, you get a new car and he doesn't have one. <laughs> He's not jealous because... Somebody's nice to you and not nice to him. God's jealous when somebody 
chooses a different God than him. So if a husband or a wife, if the husband or wife stepped out and started having husbandy or wifely relations with somebody else, then it's good for that spouse to fight for that. But if they have friends, they just talk to somebody and there's nothing husbandly or wifely or romantically flirtily about it or sexual overtones or they care about them more or whatever it is, um, easily jealous can get in also you can get in a stalking behavior, checking your checking your you know your phone and says, Where are you going? Where were you? Well, I thought you were gonna be here. You're timid, you know, all that kind of controlling behavior. You don't want that in a relationship. I just wrote a book on trust. And in there I tell a story about um this um CEO type client that I work with and and he had to go on a, a trip, which he does a lot, and and meets with a lot of women CEOs and leaders and doing deals and all that. And um, he and his wife have a great relationship, a lot of trust. And he said he's in some city. He was having dinner with uh, a woman from another company, and 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 he said. Um, he said, I'm sitting there having dinner in this hotel, and it just, he said, I wasn't, wasn't going to do it, but just, you know, it occurred to me how easy it is for people to have affairs. He said, it would be so easy for, you know, for me to do that, for us to do that. And, and he said, I'm sitting there, you know, I'm just thinking about this. And then it occurred to me how, how much my wife trusts me. And he said, I started to think about her trust for me. And he said, just thinking about just the trust that we share and how much she trusts me. And she's not jealous and controlling all because she trusts me. He said, I'm sitting there thinking about it. I'm having dinner with this other woman. I'm thinking about how much my wife trusts me. And I'm just like, Falling in love with her, the wife, all over again, sitting there having dinner just because she trusts me so much and she's not jealous and all that. I had to end the dinner and go up and call her, and who knows, you know, what that Zoom call looked like. But even the trust, and I put in the book, um, in, this, in the trust book, the section began with trust is sexy. And it is. Trust is a part of love. Love is sexy. But Jealousy's jealousy is like a the opposite of a um aphrodisiac, you know, it kind of puts cold water on everything. You have to fight for freedom, right? And how can you love somebody when you're fighting for freedom and separateness? Okay, <clears throat> so we're gonna um hop into some callers here. If um if you're watching on YouTube and you like what you're listening to or seeing, um please click like. And subscribe to our channel. It really helps us out when you do that, because we get to, um, you know, kind of build a tribe in the community. And for the rest of you, if you're not watching on YouTube, um, share it with everybody you know if you could think they can relate to this kind of stuff. All right, and I want to put on my uh, headphones here, and um, I hope that is working. Let me ask my team: Can one of you guys say hi to me and make sure these headphones are? Hello, I hear voices. I hear voices. Thank you, Alby. Got a shout out to my team, Alby and Greg, who are off in uh, cyber regions making all this stuff work across multiple platforms. You can see the the program on YouTube and Instagram and Facebook and uh, probably others that I don't even know about. Wherever um, cell phones are sold. <laughs> Anyway, okay, let's um, go to the phones and um, talk to Kimberly, who's calling us from one of my favorite places, state of Arkansas. She has a 23-year-old son who's gone through a terrible breakup and having panic attacks, can't leave the house. 
It was showing signs of suicidal behavior, but we're past that now. We're actively getting help. Don't know what to do next. And he has no motivation. Kimberly, welcome to the program. Hello. Hey there. Hi. Hi, uh, Dr. Cloud. Thank you for taking my call. You are very welcome. Where do you live Never in Arkansas? Done. I live right outside of Conway, Little Rock. Oh, yeah. Area. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like it here. I do. What is that? There's I, a, um, there's a Hendrix College, right? Isn't that there? Yes. That's in Conway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thought it was. All right. So, what's going on with your boy? Well, uh, he was uh, dating a girl. Um, How long? Who I kind of almost three years. Three years. Uh, almost big, three years. And I when deal. I met her, I kind of yeah, yeah, because the day she met him, she moved in with him. Um, Wait a minute. The day she about. met him. The day she met yep. him, she moved in with him. Yes. Yes, he, he was went home with him. He was 20? Went, yes. So was he in school I, I or was he? Had, had... No, no. He, he... Sorry, go ahead. No, I was just curious. Was he in school or he had an apartment or where? No, he was working um, for my son's business out in Colorado. Where did he live? He had went. Where he lived, he lived with my son. He was renting a room from my son, and yeah. worked for him also. So his and brother, his brother let the, his brother let the girlfriend move in on day one. Yes. Well, they didn't call it move in, but she went home with him, and then she never left. I call that moving <laughs> <And> in. So, <laughs> yeah, me too. That's how. I, I mean, it is what it is. Yes, um, what it is. I, I would like to. I would like to say this um, because. While what we're going through now is a direct result of the things that she's done and his behavior and choices he's made, bad choices, um, about four or five, about five years ago, almost five years ago, um, he had a friend fall out of the back of a truck and die in his arms. Oh, no. And he went through a real uh, hard time. We tried to get him in counseling. He went one or two times. Didn't want to go. At one point, we um, we knew he was struggling. We were talking to him, taking the church, I mean, just doing what we knew to do. One night, he came in, uh, handed us a gun. I was crying and said, "Please take this. I don't want to do this." Wait a minute. You, you said we, five we years it. five years ago. Yeah. Yes. So yes. this was back so when he lived day, at home. Yes, and the only reason I'm telling you that is because I feel like, and I could be wrong, hopefully you can answer that question, that because of that traumatic event in his life has caused him to make so many wrong choices in life. And now this last wrong choice, these last bad choices he's made <laughs> have just almost cost him his life. Um, but back then, it, that was on a Saturday. On Sunday, we called our behavioral help center. And they said, bring him in for an assessment. We did that. They locked him in. Uh, would not let us bring him out. Uh, they, they kept him five days, put him on Prozac. He was pretty much a zombie um, by the time we picked him up. But, Wait a minute. So hold, on, hold, on, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Stop for a second. He was okay. a zombie after a few days of Prozac? He, the, the pro, they put him on three different pills. Um, um, Prozac, Xanax, and something else. Um, and it was five days later, they let us, you know, get him out. And then he seemed to get better. Um, and then he started spiraling again, just de depression, like I've never seen. <laughs> so that's when but he, he But he wasn't treated. He wasn't treated. Okay. Well, we All right. So he goes to Colorado and, and then he that. meets this girl and he lives with her for three years and now they just broke up. So what's what's the question? So uh, unfortunately, I can't get the whole, home. I won't be able to get the whole okay. long history, but if there's okay. a question, I can help with. Okay. The last couple of, uh, in October, he 
she moved here where we live in Arkansas. They were living in Tennessee at that point. And he come here to help my husband um, work on an airplane and went back home in October to surprise visit her. And she had a man in the house. And, of course, he was Wait devastated. Wait a minute. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. They were still dating, but he moved or he just made a trip to Arkansas and he was going back. He, he came, No, he was going to. He moved here and then she was coming in December. Oh, OK. Uh, they All had right. gotten engaged. They were engaged, and still together. So he goes back, and she's shacking up with some dude. Yes. He came home. Surprise. Asked us what to do, talked to our pastor. We said, you need to forgive her first thing, and then y'all need some counseling. He wanted to do that. She did not. So they're talking it back and forth, back and forth. He goes back down there. Wait, she didn't want to be knew, forgiven, or she didn't want to go into counseling? Didn't want the counseling. Did did she, she want the, did she want life, did she want the other him. guy? Well, she said she didn't. <laughs> but and my son was sending her money. He was making money here working for us, and he was sending her money to pay rent, okay. pay All her right. car payment. Okay, so that well, happened in October. So down. what? Then what? He goes back down there, and she had actually moved the guy in. My she moved the other in guy in. in? Yeah, yeah, I know it's crazy. And the pastor so was, was encouraging that... him to get back together. Oh no, no, oh no, no! After the after the first October thing, uh, the pastor told him, "You you need to stop. You are not emotionally healthy. She's not emotionally healthy." Oh, okay. So he was All trying right. to get my son to to walk away from her for at least. Okay, and for years. him to get some counseling. I thought you meant for them to get some counseling. And that's well, at least yeah. we take some. So, anyways, where, good where are we thinking of that's a good idea. He was going through some suicidal tendencies, talking about it. Uh, had called some suicide hotlines. He would call our pastor in the middle of the night, crying, just crying incessantly. I, as a matter of fact, when he went down there and he caught her and she's moved him in, it took a day and a half of him sitting in his vehicle before he could get on the highway and drive home. Because he was having panic attacks, he finally when he, drove home. When he was back in Colorado, him. no, when he went to Tennessee, for surprise her. They were living in Tennessee then. Okay. This has just all happened in January, and right. then anyway, so he's home now. He's past the suicidal stuff, we believe. That's good, um, but he, he he can't function like yesterday. He spent the day. He has a job with some Christian people okay. that have been. And he's a, he's a Christian. We believe so. I mean, he, he says he prays. He asked God to forgive him for his behavior, for the choices he's been made to live with this girl, that he wants to serve God. Okay. But there is no. All right. So what's he, the question? He doesn't have I'm, anything to live All right. With. All right. What's how the do question? You, how do you get him out of his room? I don't know how to get him out of his room. He doesn't want to. Doesn't want to be around people. Well, he, uh, I I think there's only. I think he. I think. I think he's got to get out of his room, but get out of his room to only go to one other room, and that's in the room with a really good psychiatrist and psychologist available. He may need. Um, he may need some medicine. But he certainly needs some treatment. So the How do you mood do that when he refuses. Well, what do you say? I want you to go to counseling. I mean, what do you say? What's what have you I'm, tried? I'm you sorry. Are you asking? Yeah, yeah. You, you said he's refusing. Told... What What have you tried? We. We have well, the only one that he will talk to uh, is our pastor from our church, and we have offered to pay for it. We've told him, son, you, you need you don't need just one or two counseling sessions, you need to be in therapy. You've had some traumatic right. things happen, you're exactly right. And, and so, you've told him that, and he says, No, I don't want to go. Yeah, he doesn't want to talk to anybody, that it, he feels like that makes it worse. Um, he has. 
he'll get ready to go to work and get ready to walk out the door at 530 in the morning, and he starts shaking all over right. and crying. Right. That yet, yesterday morning, he asked me to come and sit with him. He does that a lot. Texas us in the middle of the okay. night. Uh, let me tell you the good thing. Ride. Let me tell you the good thing you, you got going here. The good thing you got going here is that he experiences his need for you and his need for other people. So he's he's actively connected to the part of him that's going to get him well. And that is he's able to reach outside of himself for help. Okay? That's a good thing. So I think what I would probably do at this point is I would get the people together that he experiences that kind of connection with. And like that might be his brother. I don't know the relationship there. It might be his pastor. Sounds like the pastor's good. It might be you. It might be whoever he really feels supported by and loved by. I would all of them go in together and say, look, we love you and you're going to get some help. So I'd, instead of the encouraging one-on-one -on -one thing, I would up the ante a little bit and get a little more leverage with people he knows that care about him. Mm -hmm. And I would say, even he... though even though you don't want to go, we're doing a bunch of stuff for you. We want you to do this for us. Just do it for us. Mm -hmm. I want you to agree to go. And, and then we'll talk afterwards with you and the doctor and we'll figure out if you need to stay or the next step, but just get him to go. And I do my best like to pick a where? good one. What? A good, a good, what? Like a hospital? A, a well, psychologist I don't, or? I don't know. I don't know that he necessarily need. I mean, if this were the old days, when you could have real, I'd love for him to be in a hospital like the ones that I used to run because you could have 30 days and really, you know, do a, a lot of good stuff. I don't know what your coverage is like and I don't know what hospitals are like that in your area. But, I mean, if you can't function, that's usually when we start to look at inpatient. But but that might not be an option because that kind of, pro a lot of hospitals now, they just stabilize them and get them out. There's not a lot of treatment that goes on. So it, right. he may need that, but you're not in position to determine that. That's what a psychiatrist would do. So when I say okay. take him somewhere, I want you to kind of have the appointment ready, some options, so all of y'all can get his agreement and say you're doing this for us because we're worried about you and I don't want to be worried about you like I'm worried about you. So at least do it for me because we want to help you. And then say, we got an appointment. You can either have two o'clock today or four 30 or whatever. And we're going. And if that doesn't happen, then I would talk to the psychiatrist. If it's at the level where you're worried about, I talk to the psychiatrist. I would talk to them myself, describe everything, and see if he's a candidate for, you know, for involuntary. I just don't know how bad this is without talking to him. But your main next step is to get him treatment because he may be he may be biologically depressed. There may need be no thinking his way out of this until his. Brain is stabilized. What does that mean, biologically? What is bio, bio, that word? Well, well a lot of times what happens in depression, and especially when we see panic attacks associated with it, that that sometimes there are, um, there's brain chemistry stuff going on that you need more than talking. You might need medicine to get the brain working well enough so the talking can even help. That's why I want a psychiatrist okay. evaluating him. And he could see, you know, he could potentially. Now, I don't know what happened in the first hospitalization. He said he looked like a zombie. I mean, unless it's massive amount. You don't you don't even see Prozac begin to, to generally work at that level within five days. Unless there's elephant gun amounts or something. They probably had him, my hunch, be a massive major tranquilizer. It's like 
how dollars something. I don't know. I don't know what happened. But all I'm saying is that he could need some medicine. It doesn't necessarily mean, oh, I tried that and I was a zombie. That didn't have to be the way that it has to be. I just want him evaluated because that's what I'm concerned about. Okay. Okay. All right. So should we try to find a uh, Christian psychiatrist? Well, that would be great because he would be in a tune with your values, but a good psychiatrist could figure out the medical parts. We're talking about this, you know, if he's good and ethical and all that, there's not going to be anything that really conflicts with his faith in that evaluation. That's what, but you got the pastor involved anyway. So that's great. Mm -hmm. Okay. I got to run. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Dr. Yeah. And, and, and by the way, will you tell him that you talked to somebody who's been doing this for a long time and I understand how bad it is and with the right help, it can get better for sure. I will but, tell him that. But Thank you so it's much. It's going to need some help. But we see depression and panic attacks and all of that. People get over that all the time. It's just true. Okay. But you need some help. Well, this has been three months now. He doesn't well, sleep. Doesn't that's eat. my point. That's my away. point. Look, l listen, I'm, you're telling me what I'm telling you. More time is not going to help. Three months of his trying haven't helped longer than that. And this could go on until it's treated. In my opinion, he needs, we need something to stop. Look, if you got an infection and it's not treated, time, time, time doesn't cure all things. We got to get to the reasons for this. So I'm agreeing with you. Did I lose you? And there, that it, hello? Uh, yeah. Hello? A hello? Anyway, I, I'm agreeing what? with you. More, more time isn't going to be the answer because it's been three months. If it'd be getting better, it'd probably be getting better by now. It's time plus the help. So you tell him this doesn't have to go on forever. You can start getting better, but we got to get some help. That's what I want you to tell him. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I will tell him that. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for your call. Right. By the way, uh, many of you out there, um, you might've been struggling with depression or anxiety or panic attacks. And I would encourage you to get some help, especially if you're feeling suicidal. You know, none of us, um, is designed to be into self-help. You know, sometimes people say to me, oh, you write self-help books. No, I don't. Self-help is an oxymoron. If I need help, then that means I'm unable to do something by myself. Well, now I have self-help. Well, where am I going to get the self that doesn't need the help to help the self that needs the help? It's almost like a multiple personality de facto. We need help. We're designed to receive help and support and correction and teaching and and healing and all that from each other and from God. We life is about relationship. We're not meant to exist and thrive on our own. So if you're trying to do it on your own, get some help. Also, yes, there are things that you can do that you haven't been doing that will help you. If you're able to do them, great. But one of the things we can always do, I mean, if I'm drowning, what I can always do is yell for help. I might not be able to self-help my way into swimming, but I can ask for somebody to reach down and pull me out. And that's what you might need if you're stuck. Okay, <clears throat> let's go back to um, the phones. And um, Sal is calling us from New York. His wife's unhappy, he wants a divorce. And he's very much in love with her and doesn't know how to fix it. Sal, welcome to the program. Hi. Hi. Hey there. Thanks for taking the call. You're very welcome. Um. Well, I mean, there's a lot more to that, too. It's, um, you know, we've been together for 14 years, and uh, we have two kids, and, and um, you know, she, uh, she's she been having, you know, she's, I, I just 
found out, you know, I, I feel like I'd known, I, I feel like I know more of her now in these last two months that we've been dealing with this than I've known mm. the entire 14 years. Wow. What have you um, found out this she's had, Um, well, she's, um, you know, when we got married, she told me, you know, she, she did something erratic and she, she married, uh, her college boyfriend and then got it annulled. And she came up and told me that, you know, before we got married and I didn't cry or do anything. She had, she had, she had married him and got it annulled before y'all met. Yes. And, and she told me this and she told me this before we, um, you know, um, got married and, um, how long uh, before, how long before you met was that annulment? Probably three years, maybe. Oh, okay. And how long did y'all, how long did y'all date before you got married? Um, we, um, were together. We were engaged and together for about a year and a half before we got married. Okay. All right. Now, then you said, roll the clock forward. You said you've learned more about her in the last few months. So you said, yeah. What have you learned that you um, didn't know for 14 years? Well, this man that she married and got annulled, she had a child. She had, a, she was pregnant with, with them and she had an abortion. Oh, okay. And and um, she's been carrying this uh, yeah, you know, like anger, pain, and and just bottling it up and remorse, and and, um, yeah. and then yep. And so what what sparked all of this is this this old uh, boyfriend called her, and um, and she told me that he called. And I said, uh, I said, wow, is everything okay? And she says, yes, I just, I just destroyed his life. I, I just left him with no explanation and, um, and he wanted closure. And, um, I said, okay. And, um, and I left it at that. But then I find out that she keeps on calling him now and they're calling and texting and, and she says like, you know, and then, and then now, and then like around the first week in January, she says, you know, you know, what we're doing is not normal. And I said, yeah, I agree. And, and I thought it was because of the lack of intimacy and things like that. And she's like, well, we're just, um, we're just roommates. We're just great parents. We're friends, we're partners. And, um, I, you know, we have to, um, I think we have to divorce. And I said, I don't know if I've ever loved you. I don't know if I, I don't, I know I don't feel anything and I don't know if I ever did. And, uh, and I don't think I ever did. She goes, I gave my heart a long time ago and I never got it back. And, and, uh, and, but this, but her entire family, you know, knows her, her patterns and knows her, um, you know, what her past and, um, and as soon as her family knew, they said, oh, God, please not let it be this guy again. And, and her whole family is, was trying to talk to her. She shut her whole family down. She's not talking to her siblings, her parents. Oh, well. She's talking let, to let me ask you a quick question, Sal. Uh, this all happened in the last few months. For the 14 yeah. years, would you describe her as stable and dependable and with a close circle of friends, a good mother, good emotional regulation, she, not given to impulsive behavior, all that kind of stuff. And then boom. Uh, no, she, um, some of that stuff you said is true. Like she, she's an amazing mother and, and now I know why, like she was just so nervous about having kids and she and she she's told me she broke like she kind of just like snapped one day she says i had an abortion i ripped my soul my soul is ripped out of me i'm a catholic i'm a conservative i i'm pro-life and i and i had this abortion like and i she's like i feel terrible she just snapped and then okay but i'm asking all, I, I, no, no 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 I, I i understand that i'm trying to get a picture of her functioning for 14 years so her functioning for 14 years was um, keeping up, 
keeping up appearances, um, keeping up everything was, was perfect. She was, she is an amazing mother. Um, and even on her she, worst day, she's probably better than most people on their back. She have close and, friends. Um, she have close friends. She did, and she she she's easy to easy to dump. She's had a, a big rotation of friends over the fourteen years. Big rotation, so she doesn't keep friends. Nope, she keeps them, loves them close, talks to them every day, and then all of a sudden they're gone. Okay, any substance problems or other impulsive behavior? Um, yeah, I mean, well, you can also say her just running off to uh, Vegas to get married and not telling her family about it with this with this with this person. No, I said I said over the course <laughs> of your four, over the course of your fourteen years yeah. is what I'm asking about. Um, yeah, I mean, there's like, uh, I guess, yeah, I guess you can say yes. There's, a, there's some probably some minor impulsiveness there and, you know, and, and even some, you know, issues with her family, with her sisters, you know, just something as simple as one of her, her and her sister were trying to uh, plan a vacation to go to, uh, to go somewhere. And she's like, oh, this would be super fun. Let's do it. And she's all on board. And then, and then her and her sister go, they, they, she doesn't go away with her sister or the family trip and she goes away. Her sister goes away with the other sister and, and, okay. and then she gets, you know, not included and she, and then, and then okay. she doesn't, and then she doesn't speak to those sisters, that sister for an entire year where okay. I had to come this in is, and say, this is, this is, this is, and I bet if we had more time, you know, we've kind of hit a button here of that's what I'm asking. I'm asking about the, you know, you know a number of different, levels in uh, context and about her stability. Okay, so so give me your question. We're, we're out of time here on the program, so I need a question. I mean, I just, I, I really don't know what to do. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I don't want to break up a family. I want well, what to did it mean? The, what did it mean? The, what did it mean when, when you said the lack of intimacy? Y'all don't talk or you don't have sex or what does that mean? Yeah, we don't, we don't, she has, she's very cold and unaffectionate and it's very hard to get close to her. And yeah, we, we don't, mm. we don't have sex. For how long? Um, a long time. Like six months years. or five years? Or... Ye years. Yep. Years. Because of her yep. not wanting to? Um, it was a very snowball effect of, of fights. So it was all very fights. superficial, you know, just superficial, stupid husband, wife fights that I let go, but she can't, she holds them, holds them, holds them, holds them and yeah, snowballs. This them. is and, kind of what and, I was asking about. And, okay. All right. Yeah. And yeah. this is, um, this has been a lot going so on I was for almost, a long time. I mean, we're not talking so about. I was a, almost, I, I, I was almost intimidated to even attempt to go near her and try that because of the rejection of causing another fight. So I just almost okay. let her be. I tried, I, you know, I, 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 I yeah. you know, made jokes. I try to be affectionate, try to put my arm around her, try to like do things like buy her cards, you know, buy her things. So, and do thoughtful, yeah, this um, is, this is, um, this is, um, uh, a long time of a lot of chaos and ups and downs and disservices in her siblings and disservices in friendships and not keeping friends and not relating to you and not responding to you. And why, why haven't y'all gotten help? Why, why didn't, why was it, why wasn't this addressed 12 years ago? I'm, I'm not, there's been the, I, I'm not saying you're no, bad for, I'm just trying to understand the pattern. What have y'all tried? Have you been well, in marriage counseling? Have you done anything? Has she been in therapy? No, no. I um, I finally, uh, you know, she's like, I've given you the signs. I've given you the signs. And I, you just say, well, you kind of just wash it off. I said, there, there hasn't been a sign. I said, if you came to me this upset and this serious about something and this unhappy, I said, we, I said, I would have but scared straight like I am right now. I said, and I said, I don't even understand. I said, I didn't even understand you. If you went through all this 
if you have all this pain, I said, I, maybe I would have okay. done something differently and handled you differently. Well, um, I think here, based on what you said, it, there's kind of a lack of oversight. Let's just call it that word, oversight of this relationship by her. And it sounds like a little bit by you as well that, you know, you said if you had known if she had come to you, well, there's been a lot going on for a long time. You yeah, know? she's been, she's been, a, she's been, I think she just wanted to be a mother and she, as soon as the kids came along. Yeah, but I mean, in the, in, kids, in the kids, marriage, kids. in the marriage, there's been yeah. a lot going on that hasn't been okay. So yeah. what I, 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 if you want to, you know, like you're saying, what do you do now? What I would do is I would go to her and I would say, you know, I, I I've been thinking about this and, um, I've got to own my part of this. I think, you know, there's some stuff that obviously you struggle with. I've said that to her. What did you own? I've said that to her. I said, I said, I, I am take, I'm taking 100% of the 50% blame for this. I said, I'm 50%. I'm taking 100% of that. But specifically, specifically for what? I'm just um, trying to help you craft the the conversation. Yeah. of, Of not, you know, of not, um, you know, initiating any intimacy of not like uh, talking to you of not trying to, you know, figure out what was going on or, or yeah. you know, even okay. the fights, like I'm, I'm going to put right. 50% of the blame for these fights. Well, I'm, I'm not a big one on a side in percentages, but you can take a hundred percent of your side of it. Let's just say that. And that's great that that's you did exactly that. What so, I said. so what I would say is I would, you know, I'd, I'd go to her and say, look, I really care about you. I care about our family. I care about the kids. And as I've told you, I can see some ways on my side of this that I haven't done some things that I needed to do that you needed from me. And I hear you on what that's been like. And before we blow the whole thing up, I would like, for us at least to commit to finding a good marriage counselor that we both like. I'm not going to force you to go to one you don't like, and I don't want to go to one that I don't like, but let's find one we both like and let's at least go, even if it's in the service of if you still want a divorce, at least we do that well for the family. And I would try to get her into counseling with not just the demand that we stay together, but we need some help to go through this path. Now, certainly when you show up, you're going to say, well, I want to hold it together. But I think that you've got to get some way of getting both of you in with somebody whose focus is the marriage, because just doing it with each other hasn't, hasn't worked. And I think, um, That'd be the next move. When you're saying what I think you should do, that's what I think you should do. Yeah, everything you just said, I, I, I exactly did. I, I, I okay. said to her. Um, okay. Well, I would. You know, when she, when she then I, I would go back with it. I mean, the if she's not willing to go and she's dead set that she's going to divorce, then. All you can do is try to get her to hit pause, right? Well, other- she she is dead set on she is dead set on divorce. She did file for divorce. She does is going through the motions of the divorce. Oh, you- She's still talking not not talking to her friend, not talking to her family, only talking to two influential people that are telling her what she wants to hear. And finally, so you're you're I, already day, in the path every- of divorce. I didn't know that. I yep. didn't think of and it, yep, it just it, yep, it, it all it just went down right. so rapidly. So okay, rapidly. so now I even what, told her, I, I, then I, all I can tell you well, is look, you can you can go back and fight for it until it's done. The other option you have, which you just told me probably isn't an option, is sometimes we have leverage with the people that that have input into her besides these other two people that are talking her out of it. You know, friends, family, pastor people that she would listen to to have all of them say, at least let's sit pause and go do this. If she's not well, willing to do that, yeah. she's decided she's divorcing you. Then all you have control of is you. 
but I, I don't know what to say other than try everything possible, then she might go the other way. Yep. Well, that's why she's not speaking to her family because her family knows her, her behavior and her family yeah. is going to tell her things that she doesn't want to hear. Well, they, they might not be, they might, they might not be the best one. The word I said was people that have leverage with her and somebody that has leverage either has something she needs and wants and is depending on, or somebody that has influence with her. That's who, well, that's the thing she's, she, she, and, and that's going back to her friends because her friends, she's, she's heavily. Well, those, she, those right, aren't the friends. In. Those aren't the friends that are talking to her in service of the marriage. Those are the friends that are helping her go the other way. Exactly. And she does. That's she's not, not what I was talking to. about. What I was talking about is anyone that has influence that you can talk to that might help her hit pause. Other than that, what you can do is say, you know, you wave the white flag and say, well, look, um, I'm sorry. Everything I've told you, I'm sorry for it. I'm sorry we're losing this. And I do want you to know what I'm going to do is I'm going to be on a path to get as healthy as I can be and be the best dad that I can be and co-parent with you the best that I can do and all of that. And I want you to know that the door is open. And then let yep. her see you going down the best path, best path that you can go down. But other than that, that's kind of what you got, at least as far as I can see. Okay. Unfortunately, yep. Sally, I, mean, I got to go. Okay. Okay. But get on your own path of growth. And I'm going to say a few more things about that here. Um, a lot of times when you're in a relationship that's either teetering on it or headed for it or in it, or even has been done and you want it back. You know, we talked about separateness and freedom and what we always got to do is make sure, you know, say to somebody, look, I can't control you. You can do what you want to do. But here's what I'm going to do. And you get down your own path of sometimes when they see that you are really changing and you're growing and now you're not changing to get them back you're changing and becoming somebody that if they were out there dating, they would want that one. And I've seen that happen. They go, I don't know what's happening, but this is a different person. I've never seen this person before. I I was working with a couple not long ago, separated for three years and done everything but file the papers. And all of a sudden she got on a path of becoming a different person. And he was like, I, I, I've never seen that person before. They're back together. I talked to him not long ago. He said, we have the best marriage than we've ever had, even with, long before even we were fully in love back in the beginning. But it came from the rejected persons changing. The rejected persons changing to where the other person looked at him and said, oh, they're not going back to the same person. They're going to a new person. Sometimes that can do it. I don't know if that fits your circumstance or not, but she, she was... Um, she was in a blamey position for a long time and then got an awakening. That's a good thing. We need to be bonked over the head sometimes by God and by other people and go, Oh, maybe I could change in some ways. I'm not blaming Sal for anything, but I'm saying that um, Sal, if you're, you're, you're listening, no matter what she does that you can't control, you're becoming the best version of Sal that you can be is going to be the best thing for you, period. Sometimes it can make somebody else want you back. I'm sorry for what you've gone through. It's how, you know, when you're describing, when he was describing her, there's, this isn't just things are great for 14 years and boom, there's some, um, I mean, I don't know her. I can't diagnose her from the description. But this is, I mean, it's a long pattern of um, 
lack of self-regulation, lack of, you know, stability in relationships, lack of dealing with things that were inside of her that were traumatic to her, unresolved losses. And that stuff always comes out, which, by the way, people, oh, please, especially if you've gone through a divorce, don't jump back into a relationship. We've had, um, you know, we had a caller earlier, this this young man, he met her and they moved in together the first day. I mean, literally, literally, he doesn't know her any better than like the FedEx person. I mean, FedEx comes to your door and you don't say, hey, you want to move in? Maybe we can get married, have babies, you know. Deepening trust has to be earned over time. And people make impulsive decisions because it feels so good. Well, from what the heroin addicts I've worked with tell me, the first time it feels so good that they're stuck. You can't listen to how in romantic connections how good something feels in the beginning. Romantic relationships that turn into love and stability and deepening love over time have to get past the drug trip that early falling in love puts people on. It just, it's, I wrote about this in my book, Trust, you know, that, that we have we have oxytocin and a bunch of other chemicals that go off when you first, you know, encounter somebody at any significant level. And then especially when you start gluing bodies together, that's like, remember when you took high school chemistry and you poured this and that and the whole thing went, you know, sort of like chemical reaction. Well, that's what happens in these like hookups. People think they're in love. Well, love doesn't have anything to do with it. And it's not going to sustain somebody over time. <sighs> really important. So Sal, good luck to you there, pal. I hope um I hope that uh Maybe somebody can get her to hit pause. I hate to see this happen without attempts to make it not happen. All righty. Well, once again, um, I don't know why I call this an hour show. I always <laughs> get into this stuff and it goes longer, but you know, you can tune me out anytime you want to. That's a good thing about it. Um, a couple of announcements. We have upcoming reconciliation of estranged relationships. How do things get estranged when they are? Should you reconcile? If you are going to reconcile, what are the paths to do it? And what are the steps? Reconciliation and estrangement, knowing how to mend and when to move on. Knowing should you even try to reconcile? Sometimes it's probably not a good idea. Sometimes it is a good idea, but if you don't do it the right way, you're probably the chances of it happening are less. That's coming up on April the 16th at 4 Pacific time, 6 p.m. Central time. And you got to sign up. You can just log in. You have to sign up for this one. Go to boundaries.me forward slash reconcile. Boundaries.me forward slash reconcile. And again, if you like the early part of the program today, we're going to have an outline for that with some info up there and some links to some courses that talk about all that stuff I talked about. On the boundaries.me site, members can access that. And if you're not a member, guess what? You can just go and sign up for the free trial and you get to access all of that. So not going to cost you a penny. Get to learn something. Check out the site. You might become part of the tribe. And if you become part of the tribe, then I show up in your inbox every morning with a little video I want you to do this today, coaching session. That's for boundaries.me members. And I love doing those and we have a good time with it. Okay, that's it for today. Uh, I am probably, um, I think I'm traveling tomorrow. I'm not even sure. 
I might know. What am I? I don't know. I'll see you the next time. We'll post it. I love you guys. See you next.